In our fast paced world, it's easy to get swept up in the currents that surround us, but we are the authors of our own life story and we are infinitely capable of creating the change we want to see within us and beyond. Welcome to Shaping Freedom, a show where we explore and share practical ways to cultivate extraordinary life experiences. I'm your host, Lisanne Basquiat. I'm a teacher, entrepreneur, and life strategist. After a career as a corporate executive, I embarked on my own path of entrepreneurship and focused on the human and spirit connection. I come from generations of trailblazing entrepreneurs, artists, healers, and champions of human dignity. This week, I'm joined by the wellness guru, founder, speaker, and fellow human, Ty Bouchamp. After leaving a career in publishing, Ty decided to pursue her entrepreneurial heart and follow her desire to help women of color to connect and care for themselves. We'll talk about Ty's journey from her impressive career in publishing to the founding of her wellness beauty brand, Brown Girl Jane, and why she decided to start her Instagram Live experience morning mindset with Ty. We'll also examine the privilege of caretaking and how important it is to find a balance between our personal and professional lives and how to weave through the complexities of growing at different rates than those around us. I had such a wonderful time talking with Ty and I know you'll connect with her humanity just like I did. So I am really excited to be speaking with you, Ty, finally, Ty Bouchamp. And uh, did I mispronounce your name? No, Bouchamp is Beauchamp, Bouchamp. Bouchamp? Beauchamp. Uh, My family says Beauchamp, but then, as you know, I am from the French Quarter of Newark, New Jersey. And so there are relatives that say Beauchamp, too. So I am completely (laughs) flexible. (laughs) Very flexible Uh, on that. The French Quarter... The French Quarter of Newark, New Jersey. Uh, (laughs) So actually, before we get into our interview, which I'm very excited to get into, I'm actually going to ask you a question that I know uh, I don't script at all. I have like a little couple of notes that I put down and then like we get into it and we have um, we have our conversation. But I do have a question for you that just popped up. Sure. (laughs) From where does the French influence in your name come from? That's a great question. Um, So as far as we know, it is a name that was given to us. Um, But there is um, obvious physical um, kind of ideas around where the influence may come from, you know. Um, So we definitely know that there is some French ancestry, Native American ancestry, Black um, and African ancestry. Um, But, you know, my family migrated from the South. And as we understand it, there were multiple brothers who had come over from France and, you know, purchased land and were around the Eastern seaboard. And my family ended up in Newark, New Jersey, which is why I say the French Quarter of Newark. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I did not know that you were originally from Newark. Uh, That is new information. Uh, As you may or may not know, I've uh, lived in New Jersey uh, for uh, over 20 years um, in uh, in Maplewood. And now I'm bi-coastal between Maplewood and San Diego. And as I was kind of looking around and doing a little bit of research on you, I did see the Newark reference. And so I was like, oh, shoot, look at that. I did not know that. I, I am. A, I am. A, you know, I was born in Newark. And by the time I was born, my family, my mom and my grandfather um, and all of their siblings all went to the Behringer High School, which is the third oldest uh, public high school in the United States. Um in Newark. But by the time I was born, they had migrated just a little bit north into the oranges. And so, you know, we do have that 280 connection um, and the Maplewood, South Orange, Orange connection, East Orange connection. And that is home for me. Um, And my family is still in New Jersey, but they've um, since moved more central Jersey um, in the Piscataway area. Okay, nice. So, um, let me tell you all who I'm talking to. Let's start with that. And then um, we'll we'll get in a little deeper into this conversation. So I am uh, very excited to be getting ready to have a conversation with the beautiful and lovely Ty 
Beauchamp, uh, who is the founder of Thai Life Media uh, that hosts the Morning Mindset with Thai in LA once a month, uh, the next one being on March 4th. Um, and you're also the founder of Brown Girl Jane, um, a uh, fragrance company. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and what's most interesting for me about your story, Ty, is this, that you um, have been uh, a lead editor at some of the major uh, publications that we all know about, uh, Harper's Bazaar, Good Housekeeping, O, uh, The Oprah Magazine. I think everybody wants to work, wants to have worked for Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> and then also um, Seventeen Magazine, where you were both the youngest and the first Black uh, editor, a beauty and fitness editor for, um, or director, I think, for Seventeen Magazine. And what really interests me about your story, well, first of all, I think you're an amazing human being, a beautiful, beautifully amazing Black woman. Uh, we met through our mutual friend, Mashanda uh, Chief Rare. And um, there was just something about you that I was like, oh, okay, this lady's a human and I love humans. And then later on, I went and uh, sought out some information about you when we started talking. And I learned that you had a moment in your corporate career that led to you today being such a spokeswoman for an advocate for mental and emotional and physical health for women and black women in particular, I believe. Um, and so one of the things that this program, this podcast is about, is about figuring out like, what is the question that we can ask that'll help us to create a space of learning for the folks who are listening? Like, what is a question that you and I can uh, play around with uh, that'll bring some learning, some healing, uh, and some personal growth to those who are listening? And we're going to bounce this around a little bit, but the question that I thought about was, um, how do you reset after burnout? <sighs> You know, and burnout was a topic that I wanted to talk about at the end of last year. I was on Morning Mindset uh, with you uh, during the last quarter of last year. And the goal, the, the intention at that time was to talk about burnout. Uh, and then you, um, here we are. And it's like, let's talk about like the reset after burnout. But what I love, uh, I'm going to stop talking now. And what I'd love to hear about from you is a little bit about your history, kind of how you got to that moment for yourself um, back when you were working in corporate and doing other things. Uh, maybe can we start there? Absolutely. And thank you, Lisanne. Like, I feel the same way about you. Um, yeah. I think it's so incredible because, you know, we're so blessed and so fortunate. Um, you and I and, you know, people who have similar experiences where we're able to connect and meet all different types of fascinating people who might be fascinating on paper because of a title, because of a name, and that's wonderful. But when you said that what gravitated you toward me was my humanity, that literally makes me smile on the inside and outside because um, I think that that's what life is and I'm actually working every day to be a better human um, and, um, and a human that sees other humans in ways that sometimes they don't see themselves and that can lovingly be a mirror. And I think that's my that's my special gift that God gave me just innately and inherently that now that I have awareness of it, I want to use it um, and seek to use it in, in, in the best possible way and to his divine glory. Um, so thank you for having me, my fellow beautiful human. <laughs> and I love hearing you speak. It's kind of like, I'm like, do you sing? Do you sing this on? 
I think I do, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, let me just tell you really, really quickly. If you if you don't sing, our mutual friend, Mashonda will tell you because she tells me not to sing all the time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we actually have. I'll try it out. <laughs> try it out and tell me, tell me what she says and then come back to me because, because yes, she literally is like, Ty, she just says, Ty, don't. Don't stop. Stop. <laughs> I'm like, sis. <laughs> sis. I'm going to belt it out the next time we are in a car together and I'm going to see what happens. Well, I want to I'll, I'll hear. Know. I want to hear. Um, you know, professionally, it's always been really hard for me to talk about and not hard to talk about what I do professionally. It's just that I always felt like in some ways, because I've had this wonderful um, and, 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 and by wonderful, I mean, everyone's journey is wonderful, but I've had this, you know, flashing lights and illuminating kind of like professional journey um, that I often felt like it was a veil in many ways, sometimes a wonderful veil that protected me, sometimes a veil that led in beautiful light, sometimes a veil that covered or masked something that perhaps was underneath. But I felt like it was always a veil to who I was. And, 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 and I say this now, even looking back as a 20 something year old when I started in media, um, I was fortunate enough through the introduction of my mentor, who is also from New York, New Jersey, Ray Chambers, um, hmm. um, was able to um, land an internship uh, while I was in, a student at Spelman at Good Housekeeping Magazine. And I was very um, excited about it. I performed well, I did great, and I developed really authentic relationships. And so I was asked back um, to Hearst magazines. And then when they were launching O Magazine, I um, started there um, about three weeks after I graduated Spelman. It's my first job out of school and um, was doe-eyed and bushy-tailed and curious and excited and um, silly and not knowing all at the same time, but had some sense of poise because I was just grateful to be there. And I worked really hard. Um, and I was fortunate because people saw my work ethic. They saw, you know, how I showed up. Um, and that led to me being recognized by some incredible women who saw me, right, and promoted me. Amy Gross, Ellen Levine, Gail King. And so I was promoted and fast-tracked as a beauty director, which was kind of unheard of then, especially... Um, for Black women. I mean, there were very, 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 very few um, Black people in, in magazine publishing at the time. And, you know, I think, quite honestly, looking back now, I think that that gave me something that I thought I had to prove um, mm -hmm. and wanted to show up in that, not just for myself, but for my grandmother, my mother, my Spelman sisters, and all Black women that I knew or didn't know. <laughs> I mean, like, yes. it was like, yeah. <laughs> And, um, you know, I, I climbed very quickly and ex excelled, um, but that came with a lot of sacrifice um, that now as a 45 year old woman, I look back and I go, wow, you know, had I had some of the awareness that I do now, like what would I have done differently? How would I have navigated mm -hmm. it? Um, but, you know, I think it's very typical or not atypical, I should say, for Black women, especially Black women during my time and even during this season when you're raised by a single mom, your grandparents, and taught that you have to, you know, show up for yourself. And unfortunately, sometimes you have to show up for yourself because other people won't show up for you. At least that's what they thought and that's what they shared. And mm -hmm. so I think a lot mm -hmm. of my inspiration, motivation, and drive actually came out of fear of, you know, not being able to do or achieve or support myself. Um, and, and actually, now that I think about it, I think, you know, when we move in the world, the impetus and the source of the energy is what fuels it, right? And so that's mm -hmm. also probably why I burned out because it was coming from this place of like, how do I stay here? You know, a fear of not being there. Right. Um, right. But it also was a wonderful indicator and teacher to me then um, that continues to kind of teach me now um, that 
you know, you have to be true to you. And also being true to you doesn't mean being true to any person that was your former self because you're constantly evolving. And so I really got to a place. Yeah, I got to a place and I was like, does this really mean all I thought it meant? And it didn't. And it was with that that I said, well, how can I go and find and pour myself into meaning? And that led to me, you know, working with my mentor's family foundation that led to me consulting with brands that led to me starting my company that led to me moving in front of the camera as a TV host that led to me, um, you know, starting even morning mindset and Brown Girl Jane, you know, all of that kind of like, how can I be purposeful and intentional about what I believe in this world and how I show up in this world? You mentioned um, this idea or this goal, intention to show up for yourself. At the time, what did, what did that mean for you, the showing up for yourself then? And has that changed? Yeah. I mean, I was so young. I mean, I became beauty director at 17 when I was 25 years old. Um, and so by the, I, I mean, now, you know, I am old enough to be a 25 year old's mother. So like the thought of I'm like 25, um, yeah. it meant something very different to me. I, I think then at 20, 25, 26 was when I really started to move into this burnout. I was having incredible experiences, but I was tired, like physically tired. I was, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, um, and because I, I center black women as a black woman, um, in my philosophies and my thoughts, like in my experiences, you know, as a 26 year old, I loved, you know, going out and having a great time. I loved being on the scene. I loved getting invites to party. I loved dressing up. I loved all those things. And yet I still knew that that wasn't all of me. And um, the burnout was trying to keep up with one more, one, one side or, or side or dimension of yourself and not nurturing the other one. And that's what I mm -hmm. now just define as like the equation that leads to burnout. Like, you know, when you're trying to support only your familiar life, when you're only starting to support your professional life or your financial life or you know, your relationships, your social life, you know, if you're doing too much of anything, if you're ex spinning your wheels and creating all of this exhaustion by trying to keep up in one area, you're going to burn. It's going to cause some something to happen. There's going to be combustion. And that combustion for me at that time was I wasn't nurturing the spiritual side of myself, the side of myself that cares deeply for people, the side of myself that um, wanted to see human to human without the veil, without the mask or without the mascara. You know, it's, you know, I feel so grateful. Like now, 20 years later, yeah, you know, I remember there was a time, not then, because then as an editor, I didn't wear any makeup, but I remember there was a time, perhaps even less than three years ago or four years ago, I wouldn't come on, you know, a, a podcast without having glam. You know, they're just different pieces of yourself that start to matter less and other pieces matter more. And I think it's just being willing to question and have the curiosity to ask yourself what that looks like. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do right now, even as, you know, quite frankly, Lisan, like my first burnout was at 26. I definitely had another one um, at around, 36 or 37 and I'm, I'm just getting over another one <laughs> like but I, I also think it's cyclical like I think that's the other thing it's 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 recognizing that burnout doesn't have to mean the demise of you it doesn't have to mean the end of everything it could actually be the catalyst for renewed kind of purpose renewed focus renewed appreciation for how you move and and what you do with it Absolutely. You know, this idea of showing up for yourself back for me in the earlier parts of my career, showing up for myself really meant um, showing up for other people. It was very externally driven. Showing up for myself meant accomplishing things in within a corporate environment at the time. Uh, it meant doing all the things, being all the things to all the people. Mm -hmm. And it meant um, really not focusing as much on my own 
emotional and mental well-being. Mm -hmm. It meant being able to to sort of to um, to perform and not be kind of sidetracked by the little things like my emotional health yeah. <laughs> and my mental health, right? Just like getting it done, making sure that I was getting it done. And that was at the, t you know, at, at the earlier part of my career, what showing up really looked like. And then I too had this moment. Um, and I think I was trying to think of when, I think it was like in my early, maybe my late thirties. And I remember having this, um, it was my early 40s, actually. I remember having this uh, moment in corporate where I had always been, I'm, I've always, always been pretty evenly temperamented mm -hmm. and um, pretty happy for the most part. Um, I'm a smiley kind of person. <laughs> and I would kind of blow past things because it was really about getting the job done or getting the thing done or helping my friends or helping other people. And I had this moment where I was um, getting ready to file for divorce, very close to it. And I had a death um, of someone that I loved very deeply. And I just had like this cluster of a few things happen. And suddenly I felt like I was losing my footing in life and in my professional world, which was always the place where I felt a lot of control. I always felt like I, you know, whatever's happening in my personal life, that's different. But in my corporate world, it felt like something that I could do and that I could do really well. And I had this uh, time where that just wasn't the case in the same way. And I was starting to feel teary eyed at work. And I remember going in to speak to a leader uh, who at the time I considered a mentor. And I remember sitting in his office and we were talking about something and I burst out crying. And he didn't know what to do with that emotion. Of course. I mean, in especially at that time. Oh my yeah. goodness. No, <laughs> he had no idea. And I remember like looking at his face and having him, you know, I'm making assumptions about what he was thinking, but it was like this, like, uh, there's a woman in my office crying, like, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> and it was funny because it wasn't just, you know, that one person, there was no space for my humanity within this corporate environment. Yeah. And it's not a judgment. It's just the way things were at the time in that particular organization. And actually in many organizations that those were the conversations that my girlfriends and I were having um, when we'd go out to dinner, it was about work, but in a very um, non, you know, success was really holding yourself away, holding your humanity away from the goals and objectives that you were in the workplace to accomplish yeah um yeah and i remember that it changed everything for me and so and thank you for sharing it's so interesting though because one of the words that i picked up on that you said very early was perform and i think that this idea of performance is so you know it's so riddled with all of these things, like, because you want to show up, um, you, course. you want to provide, you want to, you want to be, you want to be able to endow in some way, but this idea of performance and, and, and it's, it makes me think about, you know, and just obviously working, you know, entertainment in industry adjacent, you know, the idea of like, you know, the show must go on. Yeah. The show, can go exactly can go on but for how long can the show go on and if we're constantly performing in in unrealistic ways into unrealistic expectations that we either have uh, created for ourselves or that we've accepted as truth from other people now and and then then the question becomes then is like what's the difference in expectation performance and being accountable to showing up in ways that mm. you should be able to show up because you're, you do have resource because you do, you know, you are skilled, you have talent and that sort of thing. But, you know, the idea of 
of performing constantly is never going to be healthy, you know, for anyone. And it will definitely lead to burnout and or exhaust, exhaustion or a combustion of some sort. Um, and, and so I think that that's also really important. Like, even if we're performing at work, then we need the time when we're not performing. You know, we have to be able to, if we're performing a task that we have to do in order to manage our household, we need time not to perform a task because overperformance is never going to be good. Absolutely. And it's, it's really living in, in personal integrity. Mm. You know, you cannot, um, expect yourself to be in this performance mode 24 seven and, um, and to also feel filled. It doesn't make sense. You know, it's like you get into a car, you run out of gas, you run out of gas, that car is going nowhere. And I think that we um, forget that we too need to be filled. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm very clear these days and um, that I need to be filled. Sometimes I am, you know, in real time trying to reconcile and appreciate how to show up and perform in quotes, you know, and deliver um, what I believe I'm meant to deliver, what I'm called to deliver. And, and, and then, you know, how to take that proper rest. And I guess the question that I'm constantly kind of challenging myself with even now is like, you know, is the delivery of this, is it going to impact, you know, is it going to create an impact in, in the world, in the space that I'm in? Is it necessary? Is there someone else who can share this with me? And, or is there someone else who is better suited to do it? Right. Because it's all those things. Cause I think sometimes, you know, we think that we're the only person to do it. So my driver now is like, is it going to have the impact? And that's actually the times that I don't get things done that I'd like to get done and to achieve. I have to say to myself, well, it's because it wasn't necessarily that can wait until tomorrow. It can, you know, um, and so asking ourselves um, those those pieces, I think, really helps to put us in a, a place of consciousness around how much we're doing what's essential, what's not essential, um, if there's someone else that can share the load with us and or if there's someone else better suited to do it so we don't burn out. Right, and it's hitting that pause button to ask, yeah, you know, to just stop so that you can have that conversation with yourself. For those folks who are, you know, because we're talking about situations that may have happened at different times of our life, tell me, do you mind sharing, like, what did you do? So you kind of went through this, these couple of periods in your life of burnout, you know, I have, many of us do, uh, but for some, they're kind of encountering it for the first time or the second or third time. And they're kind of like in this space. What do you do to come out of that? Each burnout situation, I think, was different for me because I was at, you know, obviously different vantage points in my life, had different resources, had different responsibilities that were like the must things to get done. Um, The first time I made a shift professionally because I knew that that was where a lot of my pull was coming from. The majority was not me being feeling, me feeling purposeful in the work that I was doing and knowing that I needed to discover that for myself and understand that for myself. And that work actually in Newark, when I left magazine publishing and I went to Newark and started working at this comprehensive high school and working with kids from Newark and working in the school system, like that gave me a new sense of purpose that I never even knew I would ever, it could even be a possibility, even though my parents are educators in Newark. So I come from pe- a family that, you know, is communal in 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 the sense of teaching and learning in the community, but I never thought that was going to be my truth. But I realized that teaching and learning and connecting meaningfully is a part of who I am. And also it gives me a a wonderful sense of purpose for myself and what I'm sharing with people, but also what I illuminate and gain from others. And that's morning mindset with Ty, quite frankly. 
it's it's being a you know a mirrored teacher you know and not because i have more insight or intel i have my own experiences but as do other people and so i discovered that the other time i went through um burnout it it came more because of the a cacophony, quite frankly, of a lot of things I was dealing with at the time. I was a caregiver to my grandmother alongside my mom for um, full time. I was a caregiver with, to her for 11 years. And then I started to caregive for my great uncle, her brother, um, with my mom. And um, that took its toll because I was running a business, um, trying to you know live my life, even though a lot of my life was work while taking care of a the person who raised you, which was very, very hard. And um, so that burnout actually came when I started to realize that as my grandmother's life remained extended, which we were grateful for, even though it was very long to see someone in that state for as long as it was, mm -hmm. um, it started to make me question my mortality um, because here I was, I became a caregiver at 28 and, you know, going to see my grandmother four to five times a week, driving from New York City back to New Jersey, landing, you know, from flights, going straight to the nursing home or what have you, started to make me ask about my life and my health and my well-being. I had started to put on weight. And so that burnout was both physical um, and then emotional. Um, whereas the first one was really professional, um, that really challenged me to think a lot about my own emotion. Um, and so with that, I had started, I was coming out to LA for quite a, um, for a lot of work because I was doing a lot of television at the time. And so I would come out here for like three months at a time and shoot a show and then, you know, go back to New York. And I started to feel the ease of coming here. And so that's when I decided to move to New, um, from New York to LA. And so that was in motion for some time. Um, and then most recently, I mean, and this wasn't, I mean, I don't know if this was really a burnout more as maybe it wasn't quite a burnout. It was just like, something's got to give. So <laughs> the third time yeah. I didn't quite get to a burnout. <laughs> Let's put it Sometimes that way. Sometimes it's just that, right, right. You learn something. It's like, you see the signs, like, ah, uh, this isn't going well. This, this road, it's time to stop. Exactly. <laughs> And, and I've been here before. It's like, this feels eerily familiar. Different reasons, but, but eerily familiar. Yeah, always, yeah. yeah. And this had gone back to, you know, different circumstances. Like, but, you know, working, um, you know, in a, a lot, you know, and trying to build, you know, even my company, though 17 years old, is it's a startup, you know, it's it's a small business. Um, and then launching Brown Girl Jane with my business partners um, and doing both in tandem, um, where quite frankly, one, you know, when you're working up in a startup business, like, and fortunately TLM and what, what I do has some legs under it, but that's how I eat for the most part. Um, and, you know, just was like, this is too much when you're literally working 14 hour days. And in doing so, recognizing that I was I'm missing out on a, another part of my life that I have yet to really, um, I don't wanna say master, but lean into with love and with a real desire for it in my personal life. And so mm -hmm. this, you know, before getting to burnout, it's like, I have to reconcile this. So, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm still working. So I, I, this last time, what I did is, I felt crazy doing it. And I literally asked my assistant as she was booking, I was like, is this crazy? Do you think I'm crazy to do this? <laughs> are you sure? <laughs> Those are the things you do. Those are the things you crazy? do. You're like, I don't know. I'm like, But you start questioning and, and then sometimes you have to push through and take that leap, even if it feels crazy, even if it feels, as long as it's not harmful or dangerous. And as long as, you know, I, I, I never tell anyone that they should quit their job to, just because, because I don't believe that we mm -hmm. should, you know, have to struggle to figure out some of our bare necessities. But I went to Bali for seven weeks and- um, Yeah, I, you did. <laughs> I, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Every day I was like, oh, look at her ball. It's nice. I, yeah, I, it, I wanna, it seemed beautiful. I, I want to go back. <laughs> I want to go back. I really do. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah. those are my those are my three very different experiences with burnout, but I think or burnout or on the precipice of something else. And I think what it is is that when you do radical things to arrive at a radical point in your life, radical destination, um, whether or not it's the job title that you've done all of the things radically to get there, whether or not it's the degree, whether or not it's the family, in order to shift your level of consciousness and how you operate, you usually have to do something radical or equally as radical. It doesn't have to be a mirror of the other thing. It doesn't have to be a polar opposite of the other thing, but it's radical. So my first experience with burnout, and I'm just sharing this as I crystallize it for myself, I sat in this beautiful ivory tower of magazine publishing. And as I got there, I was like, okay, this is great, but there's something human I'm missing. And then I went to my home land of Newark, New Jersey to work with children who may not know the ivory tower, have not experienced that radical. Um, the other one, when I was you know, showing up as a caregiver and as an entrepreneur and business owner in New York City, where it's only hustle, 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 hustle hard, hustle harder, um, take care of. I moved to Los Angeles where the space and the air is a lot freer and clearer. People don't work nearly as hard. Um, <laughs> I mean, or it's a different type of work. <laughs> it's a very different energy. And then the same thing with, you know, my decision to go to Bali, you know, going from working, you know, on two businesses and feeling like I have to be the provider of a lot of things and everything. And in Bali, I was tended to. So, you know, sometimes I think, you know, we don't realize how radical our actions are at that moment. But if we really assess like a specific place that we got to or we arrived to and we unpack it, we can go back and say, I made some radical decisions. I took some radical measures to get here. You're not going to just be able to say, I'm going to journal it away. It can be a piece of it. Yeah. Right. But you really have to, like, if you're here, like you have to really meet that with enough force to be able to move things in a different direction or to pull it back into the center. Right. If you're, if you're way over to the left, you have to bring that pendulum back somehow and you're not gonna like you said journaling is wonderful i have you know um done every single day for most of my life most of my writing life uh but not everything can be resolved through that you know sometimes you have to just pack up and move to the other side of the country <laughs> or <laughs> leave a job or you know whatever those things are um they're also kind of efficient Yeah, <laughs> to do the, the radical things wind up being more efficient. No, I, I agree. And I, I think, yeah. I think that, um, you know, we don't recognize the opportunity in some radical decisions and some radical movement. Um, and I'm, I'm actually, you know, now that I don't, I'm not in Bali any longer. I got back about two weeks ago. Um, but, you know, trying to figure out how to apply those practices to my life here and still, you know, haven't really figured that out, but trying to. Well, I'm sure you're still processing it. You were there for quite some mm. time and it's only been a couple of weeks, you know, and it takes a while for that pendulum to kind of stop swinging. This is true. From, you know, I want to be in Bali. I'm here. I got it. You know, all of that. You work with a lot of women and you do amazing work with women. And, um, and you also have in these beautiful human conversations with people. And they are all there. One thing about you that I observe is how centered you are in who you are and who God is in your life. Um, and how magical it is to watch that, especially, you know, I myself, when I was in corporate, um, and I was in corporate for quite some time, 
um, one of the things that I noticed was that there was like this clear separation between humanity, mm -hmm. spirituality, mm -hmm. And work, work was work, <laughs> work was everything, right? And everything that people did was really in alignment with getting work done. Um, and what I noticed about you as a businesswoman and someone who is up to a lot of things, doing a lot of things, you've accomplished so much, you're building you know, your business, you're leading hundreds of other humans um, and helping them. And you're always communicating and sharing God and sharing how God is showing up within and without you. Um, and I really, I commend you for that because a lot of, you know, I, I commend the courage in that and the, the, the humility mm. in that and in your authenticity. Mm and courage to show up as who you are and and in what you believe mm. and i always see you as like that person that person who just like you exude the truth of who you are no matter what that is that makes me so happy and it humbles me too and no it makes me you're showing up as you are it makes me so happy with like just to hear yeah. that like it it brings me um I won't even describe it of joy. It just brings me, it it brings me like a um, a knot of peace, and um, so I'm grateful. So thank you for that. I mean, that's you're seen. Yeah, you're seen. Like we see you, we see you, and you are making sure that you're seen. More importantly, right? I think it's really beautiful to be seen, and I think it's and not in competition. But I think it's beautiful to be seen and it's equally beautiful, let's say that, to live a life where you are allowing yourself to be seen. Thank you. It's not easy. Um, it's not easy. Um, but I, I do, you know, it's, it's, I think the spirituality piece, and it's so interesting that you would say this because um, as I was like, before I was preparing to go to Bali, I think maybe even before I committed that I was going to Bali, I called um, a dear friend of mine who is a friend and a big sister and a mentor in many ways, and is a COO at a at a major at a major Fortune 100 company. And I said to her, I said, you know, like you know, I I'm I'm grateful to be doing this. I love that I do this. I love that I do this, but you know, almost doing a 360. Like, how do you see me? She's someone I trust. She's someone mm. that has known me for 23 plus years. Um, and I can say her name is AC Eggleston Bracey, who um, works with uh, Unilever. But she's someone that I knew when I was a assistant, you know, starting out in magazines. And I asked her, I said, you know, how do you see me, AC? Like, you know, because I've one thing is clear, like there are certain things I have no interest in doing anymore, even though I get calls to do them. And sometimes, you know, you want to say yes, because that check could be really, really nice. But, you know, I've learned to say no, to just kind of stay anchored in where I am and with whom I am, who I am. Um, but I asked her very transparently, I said, you know, who do you, she was like, you know, Ty, there's just something about this spiritual piece. Like you make me see spirituality in a way where it doesn't feel contrived or forced or, and I'm not using her words verbatim, but like, you know, where it's this, but where it's, you know, palatable and it's a new understanding of wellness because you also are so engaged from a physical standpoint, um, in a mental and emotional standpoint. And she said, it's because you lead with your truth and vulnerability mm -hmm. around, um, your love of God, your appreciation for humanity, um, sometimes with my Norkness too, but like with with all of those elements, Listen, that <laughs> that Northeast help I mean, you anywhere in the world. I mean, <laughs> seriously. I mean, it just is. It's, it's gonna be what it's, it's gonna be. Like, exactly. It's gonna do what it's gonna do. Always. But it's like, That's right. But like <laughs> you know, and I I I think that I I think that 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 is really a gift that God has given me, and perhaps it's because I've had um, moments of incredible shine and 
blessing and highlights. And I've also had some incredibly low moments. And one of the things that I have learned um, just in terms of emotional well-being, and this was something, you know, that actually I was rereading Think Like a Monk by Jay Shetty while I was in um, Bali. And, you know, I read, you know, works like The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho and, 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 uh, you know, Deepak Chopra. The key is, is that, you know, when you talk about humility, it's never to go here or there. To really try and find this space, and I don't like to call it balance or even equilibrium, but this place in the middle. So, you know, I will say this, I'm very seldom like super upset and I'm very seldom super sad. Most of the time I'm here, there are moments that that shifts. I'm completely human in that. But I think the goal in that is to kind of stay here. And so I call that harmony. I agree a thousand percent. In, co- in corporate, it's like balance, work life balance. And I'm like, what does that mean? I, th- when that's not attainable, I don't see that as attainable. I agree. What you can do is be in harmony with what's happening in your life and, and, and show up where you need to show up based on what hap- what's happening and what the needs are. Yeah. That's kind of where I see that kind of- I love harmony. Ground. It's like being in harmony with your life. It's exactly that. And I do think that um, it's important that we do that. And not just with things happening in our lives, but within our spirits, right? You know, um, I do have, you know, I have a practice every morning where I worship in the morning. Usually before I go on to morning mindset, if I don't have time, then I do it immediately after. Um, but, you know, I I'm, I try to stay here. Now, there, like I said, there are some things that definitely don't sit well all the time. And I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> you tried it. <laughs> here we here go. We go. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think that that's the key. But, you know, I just thank you so much. I receive that. And that um, is my prayer. And not not because really I want anyone to say, like, you know, Ty has mastered this. I have mastered very little. I'm still growing. But because I think in those moments, you know, when we see humanity in one another, we expand in our own humanity. Mm-hmm. When we when we see humanity, you know, when I see someone who is an incredible mother and I'm not yet a mom, I expand in my humanity when I observe that, when I take that in and really understand that. And so if what someone can take in from me is that I am doing my best to walk with God and that they see that whether or not I'm in a corporate office or on the beach or in Bali or hosting, you know, an event or producing in a, a show, then that's, I'm doing something right there. You do a lot of work with women. What are you observing? Now more than ever, it's our time. It's our time for women. I feel that, and I'm observing that women are at a precipice and an nadir at the same time, if that's possible, because I know that's polar opposite, but we are at this pivotal moment of saying like, here's where we can go, but we're also recognizing the things around us that have not served us and trying Mm -hmm. to push through those things. Um, I also am so excited about what I see as women wanting to reprioritize themselves, especially I love seeing this for Black women um, because historically it's something that we just were not able to do. We were not, it was a luxury to do so. You know, self-care was a luxury. Self-love was a luxury. Um, Self-time was a luxury. Um, connection to and it, it, all of it was a luxury, you know. And I think about being at a point right now where you can say that you want to powerfully pause, whether or not it's for two minutes or two hours or two weeks. Now, granted, with that comes we assume other things, right? We assume other experiences. But I am just so grateful that we are in a place where we're starting to acknowledge that that's the truth. And we are also being a lot more vulnerable in our conversations about it. Um, 
I will say without saying too much, I had a breakthrough conversation with my mother today. And for that, I am grateful. Um, where, um, and not just a breakthrough conversation between she and I, though I've been pushing and wanting those to happen. Um, I feel like it was a breakthrough conversation that she's been having with herself. And mm -hmm. as um, that's what I think is critical. And so for you to ask that question is really poignant and pointed at the same time, because I'm thinking about my mom in this moment for her to realize that, you know, a lot of what she's carried, she's tired of carrying. And now she's ready to make a decision, perhaps not to carry it or not to carry it the same way or to pick up other things. And that might be an easier load or a more loving load or a more compassionate load for herself. And I'm excited about that. Good for her. Yeah. So I, that's what I'm. It's that choice. Yeah. It's that choice. It's like, I love the kind of the juicy part of female adulting, right? Where we get to sit with other women and we get to sit with the experiences of other women, uh, our children, our mothers, our grandparents, you know, whatever, and, and really see each other beyond the role that's been assigned to us mm. or that's been assigned to our connection in this lifetime, mm -hmm. uh, but to really see each other as women, mm -hmm. you know, so whatever that situation is, uh, Good for her. Yeah, and thank you for Good that. For you, I Ty's think I, mama. Yeah. I am. I'm proud of her. I'm excited for her, and I'm grateful for her, and I love her, and I'm excited to for her to explore. You know, um, mm -hmm. because like I think what you just said for us to see each other as women. You know, it's interesting because that's like one of the conversations we have all the time. She's like, until you have a child, and I get it, and I receive that. I receive mm -hmm. that, mommy. Mm -hmm. I receive that, mommy. I receive mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I receive that. And yet your child is 45 years old and, you know, has been holding a lot on her own for a long time. And so mm -hmm. that part of seeing each other as women, sometimes not to see each other in relation to who we perceive that person to be or who that person has been to us is, mm -hmm. you know, what then we hold them there right? We don't allow them to kind of evolve and move beyond that. That's actually a really good reminder for me because I think about some of the young people in my life and I call them my babies and my mentors. They're like, no, nah, they're grown people. <laughs> yeah. You know, my mom passed away in a part of my, you know, um, year of crazy or year of um, discomfort, I'd say. Back in 2008, my mother passed away. I'm so sorry. Filed for divorce. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My um, uh, I left my corporate role, uh, corporate life forever. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, but I, one of the things that was so interesting about, uh, I remember with my mom, she had this thing she would talk about around um, something that happened in her life when she was 36. And so for years, up until maybe a couple of years past there, she would always kind of say like, well, you don't understand because blah, blah, blah. And I would, and it would check me mm -hmm. because I was like, well, I don't, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't mm -hmm. understand. So I'll, I'll kind of leave that. And then I remember her saying, talking about this thing. And I remember saying to her, um, hold on, mommy, that was 36. Like you keep talking about 36, but I'm now like 39 or whatever, you know, whatever age I was at at the time. And I'm like, hold on a second, let's just talk about the thing, right? And it kind of changed the conversation a bit between she and I, because before then there was always this. Um, and my mother, one thing that I really appreciated about her and still do is how much in truth mm -hmm. she was always willing to live mm -hmm. and how much, how generous she was um, in her ability to allow me to ask questions mm -hmm. and to speak how I felt about some of the decisions that were made uh, before I had the chance to actually vote. Um, but there was this one thing that she was holding out on and it was like this, you know, it's a, it was a woman thing, right? And I remember like being a couple of years past there and saying, mommy, 
all right, let's just have this conversation <laughs> because I'm not willing to accept that answer anymore. Like I'm not willing to accept that, you know, we're not going to talk about this because of my age, because I'm past that age, you know? Uh, so I think that um, that reminded me uh, yeah. of the conversation that you had or that you're referring to with your mom. I think inter intergenerational conversations are also so key. Um, They're important. They, yeah. That's the wealth. Yeah. We talk about generational wealth from the perspective of, you know, finances, which is very important. Uh, but the and uh, intergenerational, emotional, mental, and physical health is the thing. Yeah. And if you can work on that, you can have positive impact on the financial yeah. wealth and other things. Right. So I think that we, we really it's important to prioritize those um, our humanity. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, and our health. I love how, you know, the, the word human keeps coming up and it makes me think about um, <laughs> my my paternal grandmother, who also helped to raise me. She passed when I was very young, um, so I didn't have her as long as Mary, who I had the great fortune of taking care of with my mom. But my grandmother, Sarah, used to, you know, when she would go and fill out, you know, um, paperwork and it would say, it would ask race, she would create a new box that said human race and check that off. <laughs> I like that. And it makes yes. me, she was, she was like, it would say black, <laughs> white, I think maybe, you know, Asian. And they weren't, it wasn't Hispanic on there for sure at that time. Mm -hmm. She would just mm -hmm. write human. And today, you know, it's like the idea of humanity being so important. One of the things I want to, I'm attempting to focus on is being a human being and not a human doing. So going back to that, yes. that performance piece. And so when we think of our humanity, what, what makes us human? You know, it's, it's our connection to understanding that there's divine power within all of us. Um, that's not been arrested anywhere. Like God gives everyone. And I, I say this a lot, like, you know, it's always so interesting. People are often trying to look at other people's gifts and talents and skills, but God gave you something. And Absolutely. so like what God gives us, you know, um, the, the op opportunity to move, if we can move our bodies, the opportunity to speak and share the opportunity to, you know, feel connection, you know, if we desire to, and, um, yeah, I think I think the more we can focus on being human, but it, and and recognizing that that doesn't give us a pass of showing up in our humanity, right? right? Because we're still supposed Absolutely. to show up in our humanity. Um, but that just came to me um, the importance of being human and tapping into who you are. I think that you know that that is that's kind of where some of those breadcrumbs are. It's like look within yourself. And there's so much that you can find in up in here. There's a lot up in here that you can tap into. And it's great because you can see the beauty and wonderfulness in other people. Uh, but understand that you have it too. So I could talk to you forever. And uh, <laughs> I do want to talk briefly about, um, or not so briefly, you have some things coming up. So don't you have a retreat coming up in oh my Bali? My gosh, I have. Is that yeah, still happening? That is, yes, that is happening. I'm so, well, yeah. you're going back to Bali going, and you're bringing going some back, folks back with back you. to Bali, Bali. <laughs> yes, um, yes. I'm so excited about that. So yeah, so we do the month, monthly hike series here in LA, um, the first Saturday of every month. Um, March 4th being the next one. March 4th and, is the uh, next one. Then the next yes. one is April 1. Um, and unless, you know, and we do we are traveling at some times when uh, we have partners that want to bring us to specific locations but um on morningmindsetwithtie.com you can check out and see when the next hike is um it's march 4th what is that about if for pe for folks who are listening would you talk about it for a bit yes i mean honestly it's an experience uh, so it's called morning mindset the hike and experience um and it is truly, so we have four pillars that we focus on. It's affirm, it's move, connect, and reset. So really kind of drawing on what are both spiritual, emotional, psychological, and physical 
on well-being and wellness, right? And so we affirm ourselves, we affirm others, we move our bodies, we move with others, we connect with ourselves, we connect with God, we connect with nature, we connect with others, and then we reset. So that way we can ultimately do it all over again. Um, and so it's, I mean, the lineup for this next one is the biggest lineup that we've had. I'm like, am I crazy to have brought in so many incredible co-hosts? Um, because it's a full morning. So it's, it's, this is not come and hike and then disappear. It's a curated experience um, that is designed to really help you see yourself differently, help you to see yourself more aligned with God and creator and source and, you know, whatever your belief is. Um, and to align with other people who are like-minded because that's the other thing that happens when we start to do our own alignment or realignment. If we're not in community with people who support that, again, we lack accountability, we lack connection, and then we can't necessarily um, see ourselves as the divine mirrors of growth you know, that we are. And so I think community is just really important and then movement. Um, if you have a body and, you know, you have the opportunity to move, I just think it's really important for us to do. So the next hike is March 4th. And then the retreat in Bali is July 14th through the 21st of July. It's a week long retreat. Um, it's for women and their partners and others, if they desire, so desire to bring them. We will not monopolize all your time. The point of this retreat is for people to come and feel community, to feel affirmed and aligned, um, and to connect with themselves and God and with nature um, so that they can be reset and restored to go back to life and feel energized and invigorated. I'm super excited about the retreat. Um, especially since I've spent so much time in Bali, I feel like I'm inviting people home with me. Um, mm. And Bali is such a beautiful, have you been? I have not been to Bali, but I will tell you this, because, you know, I was feeling like I really need to get away. And I looked and I was thinking about going to Bali. I was like, let's go to Bali, right? And then I was like, okay, I all right, full disclosure. I was like, I am not in the space right now because I've been on so many planes this year. I did not want to be on a plane for 18 hours. I, I understand that. It was, that was, that was the one and only reason why I decided not to. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to Hawaii. Yeah. And then I'm going to go to Bali. <laughs> I'm going to go to Hawaii and get the edge off. When you're yeah. ready to be on the plane, there is no place like yeah. it. Um, and I say yeah. this, you know, humbly, but also with some personal experience that, I, and I've had mm -hmm. the most incredible experiences on the continent. I've traveled to 13 countries in Africa. I've traveled to Hawaii. Um, I've traveled to, um, you know, all parts of Europe. I've, and Bali is just different because it, it is- It's been calling me. It, that's how I felt. Lasan, that's how mm -hmm. I felt. Like I just couldn't understand mm -hmm. why it was calling me and why I had to be there, but I felt the need to be there. And I'm so excited for, I think we, we have probably about 15 more slots. We're doing um, a Zoom call about the, um, about the retreat on March 9th. I believe it might be okay. at 3 p.m. PST, but if you follow me on social and follow Morning Minds that would tie, okay. um, you can tap in there. It, I, I want every black woman and any woman, because I, I love all women and I want to just reiterate that, but I speak from the lens of knowing my black woman experience. Um, Absolutely. But I want us to feel that peace. And I pray that we can feel it together, vibrate together with it and on it and bring it back and hold on to it and live it. It is powerful. I feel that. I feel that. I feel that desire in you. I feel your intention. Mm -hmm. I feel that. So if you can yeah. come, we would love to have you. And I'm going to encourage okay. everyone to stay for as long as they can, because seven days there truly isn't enough. It's not enough. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would. Uh, I have some ideas floating around in this head. And then... Uh, a uh, little shout out for Brown Girl Jane. Little shout out for Brown Girl Jane. Um, 
I'm so grateful for what my Spelman sisters and I are building. Um, we are a beauty and wellness company um, leading with scent. When we started the brand, uh, we were leading with supplements and our, our hero ingredient was uh, CBD. Um, and now we are really kind of leveraging the importance of scent and technology that we have access to through our incredible partners um, who help us to design our fragrances um, that prove that scent has neuroscientific, uh, it's neuroscientifically been proven to enhance and change your mood. We want women and people and humans to be able to experience uh, a mood change and shift and elevation um, like that. And so Brown Girl Jane, we're three years old. I founded it with my co-founders, Malika and Nia. We're sold at Nordstrom Bloomingdale's and Saks Fifth Avenue. And we are also sold at browngirljane.com. And we are really excited about the future. And um, yeah, so. Yes, yes. Is there anything else that you have going on that you want to share? No, I'm just so grateful. And I'm happy that, Lisan, you and I, this was perfect timing. I needed this at this moment. And I'm sending you so much love and gratitude for how you're shaping freedom. Um, for your voice in the world, for what you do in the world, for your love, for your wisdom, uh, for your insight. Um, and I have a feeling like there's going to be some other stuff for us to do together meaningfully for sure. to really kind of impact for community sure. in a dynamic way. For sure. Thank you so much. I know how busy you are. I know um, I know how busy you are, and I also know how important um, – connection and really just like you said you know helping women to feel peace and how important that is to you i see how important that is to you and uh and i know that your time is incredibly valuable and you have a lot going on and thank you so much for finding a space uh space in your time in your calendar and your schedule to to chat with me in this way. I really, really appreciate it so much. I love, love, love what you're up to in the world and on this planet and how you are helping women to find their power within themselves, That's exactly. their love, yeah, their love and their authenticity within themselves. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for getting me. <laughs> That's yes. I, I definitely see you. You see me. Definitely I love it. You, girl. Thank you, babe. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much. I could chat with Ty all day. I hope that you found today's conversation inspiring. Please check her out on the Morning Mindset with Ty on Instagram. And also check out Brown Girl Jane for some amazing and uplifting self-care. I'll have a link to both in the show notes. Often as women or just as nurturing individuals, we can get so caught up in taking care of others that we forget to take care of ourselves. I want to encourage you to be kind to yourself and to never forget to protect and nurture your own humanity. You may find it in a morning devotional, in a meditation, or in a journaling exercise. Whatever helps you to connect to you. I encourage you to seek that out in your own way so that you can enjoy the harmony that comes with it. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.